Today we're continuing our message series called The Way of Love. Now God's Word says that God is love, and He loves each one, as we heard in the, uh, in the tongues and interpretation this morning, He loves each one of us. He created us. He wants us to have a relationship with Him. He wants us to follow His plan for, for our lives. And God's Word is God's love letter. That's what the Bible is, God's love letter sent to the whole world. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, He loves each and every person here. And God's love letter, the Bible tells us about God's love. It tells us about His plan for each and every one of us. Now, this past Friday, now husbands, hopefully this isn't a surprise to you. Uh, what happened this past Friday? Anybody know? Okay, it was Valentine's Day, and uh, it's a day in which we celebrate romantic love between a man and a woman. Now, that's a good thing. I mean, Valentine's Day isn't in the Bible, but it certainly goes along with the biblical concept of love. The Bible speaks of three kinds of love in the Greek language. The first is eros, which speaks of romantic love. The second is philios, which is brotherly or friendship type of love. And the third is agape, which is God's unconditional love for us. And who invented all these kinds of love? God himself did. Uh, there's different types of love, but God is love. He basically invented love, and each has its place in his plan. Eros, romantic or sexual love, is very powerful, and it's, it's important and useful when expressed within the boundaries that God's word dictates. Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 4, and you can follow along in the white page in the middle of your program. Uh, it has these scriptures and an outline in there. Jesus said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together let not man separate. Well, there's a whole lot packed into these verses, and we're not going to have time to talk about all of that in our message this morning. But Jesus, first of all, makes it clear that there are how many genders? Just so we're clear on this. Uh, two, right? Male and female. That's how we were created. There's only one kind of marriage mentioned in this passage by Jesus, and it's marriage between one man and one woman. Marriage is the only place that God ordains sexual union, becoming one flesh. Though that is the place where it is blessed. Everything outside of the marriage union causes destruction, causes hurt, causes pain. Marriage is meant to last a lifetime. So they let not man separate of people that are married together. And so each one of these truths that are taught by Jesus in these verses and, and throughout the Bible is under attack in our culture today, are they not? And today my message is entitled, Embrace Purity. We're going to talk about being sexually pure and embracing the truths of God's Word concerning romantic love and marriage. Sexual promiscuity outside of marriage is incredibly destructive. We're going to be talking about a chapter in Leviticus chapter 18 in a few minutes, and it describes many impure sexual practices that God prohibits, that he commands us not to be involved in. They are to be avoided. And towards the end of chapter 18, it, it ends and says, do not make, in verse 24, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. And we're going to be talking more about them as we go through the message. For by all these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Now, oftentimes today we hear like, well, we're new today, uh, things are new today, we're liberated, we're progressive, you know, none of these things have happened before, people didn't do these things, but nothing that we read or hear today about sexual immorality is new. They've all existed down through history, and in fact, they've existed in even more extreme forms than we see today in the countries that were around Israel, the nations that Israel drove out of the promised land. And this verse tells us that these 
impure or unclean practices pollute the very land and bring God's judgment upon nations that embrace them. Our country, the United States of America, I believe has been in a downward spiral with regard to impure sexual practices, especially since the decision of Roe v. Wade in 1973 legalizing abortion. We've seen huge increases in fornication, in adultery, pornography, human trafficking, homosexuality. Many of these illicit practices are, are not only being accepted, but they're being promoted. They're being encouraged even by more and more churches across our country. And God wants each of us, he wants our church to stand on the truth of God's word. We need to understand what it says about these issues. We need to embrace purity for ourselves. And we need to do what we can to seek to protect our country from the flood of perversion that is all around us. So let's see what God's Word tells us about embracing purity. Sexual immorality defiles. Now our culture teaches us that sexual immorality, it doesn't hurt anyone as long as it's between consenting adults. You ever heard that before? Like it really doesn't hurt anybody, it's, it's just if what you want to do is okay. But that is completely wrong. Sexual immorality of any kind defiles and it hurts everyone who is involved. Not only does it defile the people that are involved, the other relationships of those people with others are defiled as well, as, as is the very city, the land in which they live. And so as believers, I'm speaking to us as believers here to, this morning, if you're not yet a believer, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to become one towards the end of the service. But as believers, as citizens, we must choose to be pure. Going back to the beginning of Leviticus chapter 18, verse 3, it says, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. And so both the Egyptian and the Canaanite cultures were incredibly wicked. They were perverted with respect to sexual immorality. We see from Israel's history in the Old Testament that the sexual immorality of the surrounding people was a strong temptation to the Israelites. And often they would fall for the sexual immorality that was involved in the worship of pagan idols around them. And God gives clear instructions, clear directions for his followers to follow his rules, to follow his statutes of purity because he is the only Lord God. He's the one who created us and he's the one who knows what is best for us. We need to reject sexual immorality. Verse 6 says, None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. And so as we read through Leviticus chapter 18, we see God warns against all types of sexual immorality, uh, known to man even then or now. And so this is the first one. Sexual relations with a close relative is, is forbidden by God. It's defiling. Verse 20, you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her. So this is speaking of adultery, another form of sexual immorality where at least one person is married. Uh, this is to be rejected. It, it breaks the marriage covenant. It causes uh, great problems. Fornication is sexual immorality between two unmarried people. It's also condemned. It breaks God's boundaries for sexual relations. Now why... What is one of the reasons that God has created for a man and wife in a marriage uh, becoming one flesh, having sexual union? It's for the creation of children. Now, that's not the only purpose, but that is certainly part of it. And when children are created outside of marriage, either through adultery or fornication, oftentimes what happens, the parents want to get rid of them. They're unwanted Children, and that leads to the sin of abortion, or in the Old Testament, was called child sacrifice. Leviticus 18.21, quite interesting that this verse appears in the midst of the prohibitions against sexual immorality. It says, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Molech was a pagan idol. Uh, it was a pagan idol that uh, they would 
have a fire burning inside of it. It had arms that reached out, and the arms would be glowing red hot. Children would be placed in the arms of the, uh, of the idol and burned alive as sacrifices to this God. And God said, you shall not do that. You shall not offer your children to Molech. Even today, uh, 90% of abortions are carried out on single women. And obviously, uh, there was a sin of fornication or some type of thing that led to the birth of the child uh, or led to the person becoming pregnant. And so the two are related. There's a close relationship between abortion and sexual immorality. Leviticus 18, verse 22 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And so homosexuality is condemned, uh, both here in the Old Testament in multiple places, as well as in the New Testament. It is the only sin in this passage in Leviticus chapter 18 on sexual immorality that is said to be an abomination, a very strong term uh, rejecting homosexuality of any kind. Now, it's significant in these passages, as I was reading through them again, that sexual relations is often referred to as uncovering nakedness. Uh, one of the most prevalent types of sexual immorality today is pornography. It's, it's really digi digitally uncovering nakedness. And so at a minimum, pornography um, leads to lust in those viewing it, and it often leads eventually to sexual immorality in one form or another. Now, Jesus taught us, as we'll get to in a minute, the Ten Commandments says you shall not commit adultery. And what did Jesus tell us? He taught us that if you lust in your heart again with someone, you have committed adultery in your heart. And so obviously, uh, pornography often leads to that sin. The production of pornography often involves human trafficking, and it it harms those who are involved, uh, especially children. So sexual immorality, like many other sins, is addictive. It's hard to quit. And yet Jesus came to set the captive free from any form of bondage. And that includes sexual immorality. And as we had in our announcements, we have a living free class on Thursday nights. Uh, on Thursday nights that helps people deal with addictions in their lives, including uh, to different forms of sexual bondage, and we'd encourage you, if you're struggling with something or you know somebody that is, to take advantage of the help there. Now let's talk about the dangers of sexual immorality. There are many dangers. Uh, there's obviously danger to your relationship with God. Sexual immorality is sin. There are danger to your relationship with other people. It, it can fracture and destroy relationships. There's danger to your physical health. There's danger of becoming addicted. There's danger to your eternal destiny. The book of Proverbs contains many warnings about immorality's dangers. Uh, and we need to learn to stay away from it, practice abstinence from sexual immorality. Proverbs 5, 3, and 4 says, The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Now here, what is the forbidden woman? Well, it's, it's, it's basically any form of sexual relations outside of marriage. Uh, the temptation of a forbidden woman is enticing, is it not? I mean, honey is sweet, right? It's, it's, it's enticing in many different ways. But if the temptation is given into, the end result is bitter, it's cutting, it's damaging. And other verses in Proverbs say it leads to the very gates of hell itself. And so each of us, as believers, we must ask God to help us to practice abstinence from any form of sexual expression outside of marriage, because God himself is watching. You can read the whole passage. We don't have time to this morning in Proverbs chapter 5, but in going down to verse 20, it says, Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman, and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he's held fast in the cords of his sin. And so in these verses, the, the whole concept of sexual sin is spoken of, of being intoxicating. Now, oftentimes we use that word 
to refer to alcohol, right? We know we can be intoxicated with alcohol. And the same is true of sexual sin. You can be intoxicated with it. You can, you can be addicted to it. Now, sometimes, oftentimes, sexual sin can be seemingly hidden. You can sin sexually in your own mind. You can sin sexually at your own computer when nobody else is watching. You can sin sexually with a partner, and it's only between you two. Nobody else knows, but somebody else does know. The Lord, he's watching everything. And a lifestyle of sexual sin will lead to God's judgment and really an eternity in hell. The final verse of this passage, it speaks of a person who's ensnared in sexual sin as being held in bondage by cords of his sin. We don't have time to talk about this too much today, but recent research in brain chemistry as they look at different MRIs of brains, shows that the deterioration of brains of sexual addicts is, is essentially the same as the brains of drug addicts. Various neurons are affected in your brain uh, when you become addicted to various forms of sexual perversion. And through repentance, through seeking God, people can be set free from these cords of, of sexual sin. And so it has great danger both for individuals, and really for our whole country. So how can we as believers respond to the dangers of, of sexual immorality? Well, first of all, we must stay as far away as we can from sexual temptation. Satan's scheme, and he has many schemes, is to present sexual immorality of all kinds as normal, as prevalent, as everybody's doing it, uh, and we see that on television, we see that on the internet, we see that in movies, etc. Uh, one that is being promoted and encouraged dramatically more today is the sin of homosexuality. And if you oppose it in any form, uh, you are labeled with all kinds of labels and, and slogans. Uh, it is clearly a sin in the Bible. We have even people saying that what the Bible refers to it is completely different between what is going on today. No, it's exactly the same. Uh, homosexual is exactly the same today as it was in the time that the Bible was written. Uh, God's, uh, Satan's plan is succeeding. Uh, people are scared to say anything negative about, I don't know, the alphabet soup, you know, LGBTQ, uh, whatever it is. And uh, we even have a homosexual presidential candidate uh, in, the, in the present now. Homosexuality is being endorsed by more and more church denominations. If you're not keeping up, it's, uh, one after the other is endorsing it. The danger is not just being involved with it ourselves. We might not be involved ourselves, but it's accepting and promoting it. And we must not take part in that. You know, never before in the history of the world has such a range of Sexual temptation's been available as is available today on uh, our media with simply the click of a button, a click of a link. And so rather than immersing ourselves in a decadent culture, we must choose to immerse ourselves in God's word, in prayer, in the things of the Holy Spirit of God that, is, that he is calling us to, embracing purity. Now lest we think all talk or all actions regarding sexuality is wrong. God has a plan for sexuality. Uh, God is the one who invented male and female. He is the one who said there were two and only two genders. There are no other genders. Now, this is not just according to the Bible. Uh, anybody who knows anything about biology recognizes there are two distinct genders. I mean, it's encoded in our DNA. It's, it's created in our bodies. Uh, there, are all, one and, there are only two genders, and we need to stand against this multi-gender thing that is, we can't get into it, but is causing horrific child abuse, where children are being cut to pieces and fed hormones uh, because of the whole transgender travesty. But these two genders lead us to God's model of marriage. God created Eve from Adam. And in Genesis 2, chapter 23, uh, Adam said, as God brought Eve to Adam and presented her to him, 
He said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall not leave or man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so these verses in Genesis, we've read how Jesus quoted them in the Gospel of Matthew. And so God's model for marriage was for sexual union to produce a unity, a oneness, a one flesh between a man and a woman in marriage. And for that union to bring forth godly children. They were to multiply, uh, bring godly children into the world to carry on God's plan, to carry on God's work. Notice this is before the fall, before sin came into the world. The husband and wife were naked. They were not ashamed. In a godly marriage, in a believer's marriage, there is no shame in sexual union. It's God's way of creating oneness in marriage. These principles are so important that God made them part of the Ten Commandments in his plan for purity. Exodus 20 verse 14 says, you shall not commit adultery. And So this is the seventh commandment. Prohibit sexual relations outside of marriage. Uh, Specifically, the sin of adultery and more generally as we look through the expansion of this command in the book of Leviticus, all types of sexual immorality are, are condemned. And it is intended to safeguard God's model of marriage, what he designed marriage to be. Proverbs 5 verse 15 says, Drink waters from your own cistern, Flowing water from your own well, should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now this is poetic language. These verses are speaking about limiting one's sexual relations to only the marriage relationship, not spreading it out in the streets to other people or in other ways. To do that would be to damage the marriage. To do that would be to forfeit the blessing that comes from being faithful to one's marriage partner. And as we follow God's plan of purity, it brings joy into our lives and joy into marriage. The New Testament, we don't have time to look at it, speaks of marriage as pointing to the relationship between the church and Christ. The church is the bride of Christ, and our marriage should reflect that relationship or mirror the relationship between Jesus and the church. As believers, our marriages should be examples of God's love being lived out on this earth. We should be rejecting worldly standards of sexuality. We should be training our children to live lives of purity as as well, which is the best and only way we are to live. And so in conclusion, we need to embrace purity at three levels. First of all, we need to embrace purity in our own lives and families, to embrace that purity, to to live it out, to teach others. Secondly, we need to continue to embrace purity as a church, uh, which are talking about our local church here and in the Assemblies of God, which is our broader worldwide fellowship, and we are committed to doing that. And Assemblies of God is is, uh, staying true to God's word on all of these issues. Unfortunately, if you read the news, many other churches, many other denominations are embracing the impure homosexual agenda. The Methodists, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, Episcopalians, United Church of Christ, and we probably could go on, are all beginning to embrace uh, these, these impure teachings. If you have friends or family in those kind of churches, it's time for them to find a God-honoring, Bible-honoring church. Finally, we need to embrace purity as citizens of the USA. So how can we impact? How can we change our culture that seems to be headed in the wrong direction? Well, the first way is to lead more and more people to faith in Jesus. Because when God works in our hearts, he begins to show us the truth of God's word. But that is not the only way. See, in a democratic country in which we live, because it's based on biblical principles, we can And we must influence others to live by biblical principles, even those who are not believers. And we can influence others uh, to do the right thing in in many of these areas. And so in this election year, 
uh, every Christian, every person who desires to honor our Constitution, we need to get involved in electing leaders who will govern by biblical principles. The future, I believe, of our nation hangs on this pivotal election in 2020. Now, I believe that going forward in our nation, we're going to see that what happens on the state level, we live in the state of Missouri, is going to become more and more important. But we're going to see, I believe, is states that operate with biblical principles that elect leaders that lead by biblical principles are going to be blessed. And states that disregard biblical principles and leaders are going to encounter God's judgment. And we're going to see that more and more. There's going to be states that are going to be blessed. There's going to be states that are judged. It's happening already, and it's going to become clearer and clearer as time goes on. But those who embrace purity, those who encourage others to do the same, are going to be blessed. The first step to becoming a believer who embraces purity, to becoming a Christian, according to the Bible's definition, is to admit that you've sinned. Uh, the Bible says that all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and we've all sinned in different ways. We need to simply admit that we've sinned. Secondly, we need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven. He paid the penalty for our sin. Invite him into our lives and commit our lives to following him as our Lord and Savior. So I'd like to ask everyone to bow your heads right now. We're going to pray a simple prayer. If you have never committed your life to Jesus Christ or you'd like to recommit your life to him uh, this morning, we pray, uh, we ask you to pray along with me. Say something like this, and God knows your thoughts. Just pray in your mind. Say, Father, today, I admit that I've sinned. I've sinned in different ways, and I, I know it's wrong, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that I might be forgiven Pay the penalty for my sin. I repent. I turn away from my sin. I invite him into my life. I believe he rose from the dead. And I commit my life to following him and the things that he tells me to do in his word all the days of my life. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, today we thank you for your clear commands in your word regarding purity. Today we make a choice to embrace purity in our families, in our church, and our country. Forgive us for the times that we've succumbed to the, to the pressure of our culture and we have sinned in thought or deed. Set those free among us, God, who have become entangled in the cords of sexual bondage. Help us to stay far away from Sexual temptation, help us to build our marriages and our families according to your plan. And we pray, God, that you'd help us to influence others with the truth from your word about who Jesus is, about how he can set us free, about sexual purity, about marriage. God, may those in churches that no longer teach your word on these issues and others have the courage to leave and to find biblical churches. We pray that many more would come to this church and other churches that accurately and truthfully proclaim your word. In this pivotal election, God, help us to know what we must do for ourselves and how we can promote and elect leaders who will follow biblical principles. We ask for your grace, God, to give us more leaders that will restrain evil and promote righteousness right here in Missouri and in the whole country of the United States. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.